Good Saturday, Crime Talk aficionados. Today is Saturday. That means it is the Crime Talk recap of the week. This is our top stories throughout the week. Hope you enjoy it. They're worth watching. And as always, hit that subscribe button and leave us a comment below. Have a wonderful weekend. Next on the docket, hey, remember that South Dakota attorney general who was heading home uh, from a political fundraiser and just happened to hit what he thought was a deer? Oops, later turned out to be a guy on the side of the road. Well, guess what? That case is still pending, all right? Now, the attorney general in that case is Jason Ravensborg. And he struck and killed a man while returning home from a Republican Party dinner. And this was uh, late last summer. Now, I don't know the attorney general. I don't even know if the guy drinks. But I've been to a lot of political fundraisers over the years for all parties and no parties, you know, both sides. And one thing there is no shortage of is alcohol. Now, we don't know, but let's be realistic because we also know that Mr. Ravensborg said that he did not consume any alcohol that day. And the manager at the Rooster's Bar and Grill where the event was held has declined to answer any questions relating. That's just simply saying it's an open investigation. Now, a lot of people are becoming very frustrated that nothing has taken place, including Governor Christy Nome. Now, she said that obviously she can't do anything to relieve Attorney General Ravensborg of his position because he's an elected official, but she's disappointed that some action hasn't been taken. Now, Ravensborg has a public relations, a public affairs guy working for him, and he states that Ravensborg too would like this investigation to end and he would prefer more transparency. This matter should be a little concerning. First, we've said all the time, what happens when political people get in trouble? Oh, they open up an investigation. And what happens to that investigation? It goes on and on and on, and they basically hope that the whole thing just goes away. And most of the time, it does just go away, or they say on a really low-key Friday afternoon that they can't pursue charges. But in this particular case, it seems like it would be a very straight, simple matter. Most attorneys that do criminal defense work have handled cases involving hit and run, vehicular assaults, vehicular homicides. Yes, they involve traffic accident investigation uh, analysis. They involve obtaining, if possible, the uh, basically the little black box, the data that comes from the vehicle to see if there's anything in there which would indicate how fast the vehicle was going when the body uh, was hit uh, by the car. Pretty straightforward. That can maybe take a couple of weeks. Here we are now almost eight months into this investigation. Come on, all right? Now in South Dakota, there are a couple of things that can actually take place with dealing with an automobile accident that results in the death of another person. Really, there's four actions, all right? You got negligent, careless, reckless, and an intentional act. Vehicular homicide and vehicular battery require the operator to be under the influence of alcohol or drugs and also operating the vehicle in a negligent manner. Now, in this particular case, Ravensborg didn't take a blood alcohol test, no breath, no blood test was drawn. In fact, because it was some 15 hours later that he returned back to the scene. So in order for an operator to be criminally responsible for the death, if they're not under the influence of alcohol, their actions must be reckless or intentional. The South Dakota legislature uh, specifically rejected a negligent homicide law several years ago, thus leaving reckless or intentional actions as the only means of an operator to have criminal liability. So what do we know about the facts in this particular case? Attorney General Ravensborg called 911 somewhat shortly after the crash. That call was released a month later. We actually released that audio when the 
audio was in fact released of the 911 call. What is somewhat interesting is that he mentioned his title right away. You would think if he was truly concerned, it wouldn't really matter, but he wanted to let everybody know they were dealing with Attorney General Ravensburg. And he said that he hit something. And he stated that he was on the High Moor roadway there, and it was in the middle of the road. Now, the location of the accident really comes into dispute. The South Dakota Highway Patrol reports state that Ravensburg car was actually on the north shoulder when he struck Mr. Beaver, who was the gentleman that was killed. The crash site is on the west side of town. There's a convenience store nearby, and there's a gas station, a machinery business, and a State Department of Transportation shop. All have lights that are on all night, so the fatal crash didn't happen in the darkness of a prairie night, like I think a lot of people thought early on, just like I did, right? We've all been on a dark, secluded road where you can hardly see anything out there until it's literally on you, but that apparently is not the case. A county sheriff by the name of Sheriff Mike Volick, he lives nearby, and he responded to the call. Now, Ravensborg claims he didn't know what he struck, but the dispatcher suggested it could have been a deer. These are apparently quite common in this particular area. Ravensborg says that he used his flashlight app on his cell phone, but could not find anything that he may have struck. His car was not drivable with the passenger side front and the windshield extensively damaged. At the crash scene, there were apparently tire marks that clearly showed Ravensborg's car had moved sharply to the north and come to a stop about 100 feet or less from where Bover's body was later identified by his cousin. It's unclear how hard Volek, who's refused to speak to the media, looked for the deer or whatever the attorney general said he had struck. A tow truck was called and the driver removed Ravensburg's 2011 Ford Taurus which was his personal car. While this activity was underway, Bover's body was on the side of the road on the north shoulder inches from the westbound lane. His body would remain there for approximately another 10 hours. Deputy Volek didn't give Ravensburg a blood alcohol test. In fact, he went one step beyond. He loaned the attorney general, who he apparently knew, his private car so that he could drive home to Pierre, South Dakota. Then the following morning on September 13th, Ravensburg was returning the sheriff's car accompanied by Tim Borman, his chief of staff and a former Falk County state's attorney. He was in another vehicle. Ravensburg said he spotted a body on the side of the road and alerted the sheriff immediately. 15 hours after the accident, Ravensburg did have a blood test which showed no signs of alcohol, but that was some 15 hours later. Needless to say, the state's attorneys that are investigating this case need to make a decision. If they don't believe that the attorney general did anything wrong and that he was not negligent, as the victim apparently was in dark clothing, then let the people know. If for some reason there's evidence to suggest that the attorney general was negligent or reckless in his driving, which resulted in a death, so charge him. No one is above the law. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. The family of the missing toddlers, that's right, the adoptive family of Orin and Orson West, they're receiving threats. 
Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this particular case, the West boys were adopted by the West family. The boys were adopted in 2019, and they were reportedly last seen in the backyard of the family home in California. Last sighting was on December 23rd. The adoptive father, Trezel West, has told the police that he realized that he had left the back gate open. He ultimately panicked because he couldn't find the boys. He immediately went inside to search the house. His wife was in there. She did not have the boys. Now, the West family has four other children that are in adoptive care, and that is kind of normal procedure since these missing children took place under the parents' care. Once the boys were not found in the house, Trezel went around the neighborhood in his car looking for the boys. Nothing was found. They ultimately called the police shortly thereafter. The police have said there are no suspects. They do not know what happened to these boys. The reality of it is now people are starting to blame the family. And not only are they blaming the West adoptive parents, they're blaming the adoptive grandparents. And people are actually outside the homes of the adoptive grandparents demanding that the children be produced. Understand, this is a very emotional case. These are young children. They need to be found. But the police have not identified any suspects. So to go around protesting outside individuals' homes is probably not the best use of time, and it could probably be better spent trying to coordinate with the police and some sort of search around the area in which the children went missing. We'll talk about this case this evening when we go live. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Do you think the adoptive parents should be a suspect? Or do you think there's just not enough evidence at this point? That's right. We just received an order in the Lori Vallow case. As you may recall, on January 6th, they had the hearing to disqualify the prosecutor, Mr. Wood. That was denied. I'd said all along, didn't have any merit whatsoever. But Mr. Means, what does he do? He files a motion to reconsider. He did that on January 19th. Coincidentally, that motion is not available. It says that there's an error getting to it. But apparently, pursuant to the court's order, Mr. Means cites simply to the United States Constitution, the Idaho Constitution, and any other applicable rule of law. I'm not sure if that's a, a legal cite, uh, any other applicable rule of law. The court's order is rather concise. Basically, it says, while the Idaho rules of civil procedure contain provisions for a motion to reconsider, hmm, that's right. Civil case, things that Mr. Means does. The court notes in Idaho, there is no counterpart in the Idaho criminal rules. The Supreme Court has confirmed that. There's no basis in law for the judge to grant a motion to reconsider. And let's face it, the judge is not going to reconsider his decision. Denied again, Mr. Means. A little follow-up regarding our little bonus video that we put up regarding the order in the Lori Vallow matter. Now, I got kind of a little bit of a frustration with the Idaho case information data that they make available. This order came out yesterday, but it didn't have the motion that was actually filed. Now, we can glean from the motion that... Um, Mark Means filed on behalf of Lori Vallow, that it was a very generic motion. As the court said that Mr. Means only filed a very brief statement, basically asking the court to reconsider the denial of removing Mr. Wood as the special prosecutor in Lori Vallow and Chad DeBell's case. The court said in this motion, the motion cites the Idaho State Constitution, the United States Constitution, and any other applicable rule of law. Well, normally, the attorney's job is to provide the authority that the court is going to rely upon to change their decision. Now, are motions to reconsider filed on occasion? Certainly they are. But what is the key ingredient when you file a motion to reconsider? You have to have new information that really wasn't available at the time of the hearing or at the time that the court ruled, 
and therefore you're saying, Judge, we'd ask for you to reconsider the motion in light of this new evidence that we have uh, brought forth or the proffer uh, that we are making that we would bring this evidence forward. When you say any other applicable law, what the hell is that? Um, that is just a Hail Mary, so to speak, like, Judge, help me out here. I'm not really sure why Mr. Means filed a motion to reconsider other than he thinks the court is wrong. Welcome to the world of criminal defense. Welcome to the world of criminal defense when you lose nearly every motion filed. Why is that? The law is written in favor of the prosecution. And you simply don't get to go back and rehash it. You've made your motion. You've had your hearing. You lost. You can certainly raise that issue on appeal if it comes to that and because the issue is preserved. Filing a motion to reconsider is frankly a waste of your time, the attorney's time, the client's money, and frankly, a waste of the court's time. Clearly, the court didn't spend a whole lot of time on Mr. Means' uh, order yesterday as it's literally less than half a page and basically says there's no basis in the law for me to even grant the relief that you are requesting. I do not know what Mr. Means expected the court to do, but usually it's the attorney's job to say, court, here is the law that gives you the authority to do what we're asking to do. You're not going out on a limb. I just don't understand it. We'll try to give Mr. Means a fair shake. We've actually said that we've agreed with him on a few things, but I just really don't understand what he is doing in this particular case. All right. Enough of Lori Vallow and Mr. Means for today. Next on the docket, the prosecutors in the Kyle Rittenhouse case are told no. A Wisconsin judge on Thursday denied a request by the prosecutors to increase Kyle Rittenhouse's $2 million bond and issue an arrest warrant for him after the prosecutors argued that the teenager charged in the fatal shooting of two men at a protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, violated the terms and conditions of his release and bond by failing to report to the court the address of a safe house that he was staying at, which he moved. The district attorney wanted an increase of some $200,000 and have Mr. Rittenhouse rearrested until he post that additional $200,000. The court said, I don't even have the authority to issue the warrant that the district attorney is asking for, and that the court completely disagreed with the analysis of the district attorney as it related to why and if any bond conditions were violated. The court noted that it's very unusual for the court to have the home address of the defendant, but the prosecutor said, hey, this is a very serious case. We need to know where he is so that we can make sure that Kyle Rittenhouse is complying with the terms and conditions of his bond. The attorney for Mr. Rittenhouse stated in open court, just as he did in his pleadings, stating that Mr. Rittenhouse has moved from his mother's residence for safety reasons. And if the court and the district attorney really want that address, then he will file that address with the court as long as it is maintained under seal, which means no one except for the parties in the case can have access to that document. The court agreed, the district attorney went away upset, and I'm sure he will continue to try again. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.